Great, we are recording now. Okay, well, I'm Dave Larson, KV0S, and this week um, I actually got the magnetometer from Dave Witten um, yesterday, and today I was trying to set it up, and I was having trouble, and I'm having trouble, and I said, well, this worked before, having trouble, but it was discovering things but it was not uh, collecting data. And I've fiddled with it and fiddled with it. And at the end, I had uh, my old uh, small board magnetometer. So I pulled out the PNI board and put it in the new board and it worked. So I have a failed PNI board. <laughs> well, not failed, half failed. It communicates its protocols, but it does not collect data. So I assume it's uh, a solder or something. Uh, if anybody's got an idea how what we can do with it, we'll talk about that later. Okay, next on the list, we have Nathaniel, W2NAF. Go ahead, Nathaniel. Thank you, Dave. It's been a busy week here. We've wrapped up classes at the University of Scranton. My students are busy working on their DSP final exam right now. Uh, I gave a technical talk and a keynote at the Radio Club of America uh, symposium on Saturday. Uh, we've been guiding, advising a number of people um, in the ham site community for doing posters for the American Geophysical Union meeting, including Dev, uh, who will talk about his later, and uh, Steve Serwin's doing one with the Doppler shift. Christina Collins is doing one for uh, Case Western and the Eclipse. Um, we have another one with... Uh, Asti Bot at SRI in California looking at traveling atmospheric disturbances. And there's another one um, that somebody else is doing too. So we have, and I'm also working on one. So it's been a very, very busy week and it's not slowing down. So <laughs> we're working on it. Back to very, that. Very good. Uh, next on the list is Dave Witten, KD0EAG. Go ahead, Dave. Hello, all. Um, I've had a busy day and been fairly busy um, uh, for, the, for most of the last week. Uh, but the, uh, especially today, we got um, the um, production magnetometer, or at least the production test magnetometers in the mail um, late Saturday sometime and got one today, got a pair today and I've been working on, you know, making proper housings for them and getting holes and such uh, in the, my yard and buying dirt to pile up around them and so forth. But um, uh, today, um, I kind of overslept and woke up to quite a lot of activity by Dave Larson here and, <laughs> uh, and also uh, uh, Jules um, uh, uh, um, and both with questions and and issues and mostly about software, uh, which I was really and also of course today's the day that old clients decided to call me up with immediate you know urgent problems that needed my attention. Um, but anyway, in the meantime, I kind of managed to get things set up in a more appropriate testing configuration for these things. And um, I believe I'm pretty much there now. Things are running and uh, we're, we're working to get a more, I'll be working in the next few days to clean up the output that goes to the logs and I still I need to get the metadata information from John because I don't really know what needs to go in there and also make sure that the, the um, formatting is consumable by all. Um, then uh, the number two job that I plan to knock out is a an R-Sync, um, uh, some sort of a script and whatever it takes to and get an R-Sync task on one's um, 
magnetometer, uh, I mean, on, on one's Raspberry Pi or whatever, that will um, upload log files a couple times a day to the uh, Linode um, instance that um, that uh, Nathaniel provided, and will that way we'll have a place to put um, put log files um, and need to make new instructions and, and simplify some of the software so it's easier to more straightforward to use and um, I don't know what else, but those things over the next few days will probably be trying to knock out as many of those things. There's doubtless some some potholes in the road uh, that'll need to be fixed along the way, but uh, that's that's what's that's what's occupying me at the moment. Over Very to y'all. Uh, next on the list, we have Dev. Go ahead, Dev. It's me. Yes. Thank you so much. So as Nathaniel said, uh, it's been a busy week. Uh, we have been working, uh, I think, many in the PSWS, Personal Space Weather Station project. Many teams are working towards a poster. I finished mine. I have already what they call as published in AGU. And if time permitting, I would like to show a video uh, when the general discussion opens. Uh, I think which I have sent a link in the Tangerine uh, list email uh, as well. Uh, so I think we're slowly making progress and I'm occupied with uh, a bug in running the Farlap ray tracing package in MATLAB for the Linux 18. Ubuntu 18.04 machine that I have now. So I could not fix the bug. So if time allows, I would like to discuss those two points. Okay, uh, very good. Well, next on the list is John Ackerman. Go ahead, John. Uh, hello, folks. Um, I thought it was about time to uh, give an update on how the clock module design is going uh, after uh, a lot of work that's been going on for the last several months. So uh, whatever is the appropriate time, I've got uh, a little presentation with kind of the, where we are and also some uh, uh, preliminary data from some breadboard testing we've been able to do. Well, the pattern is a la the old TeamSpeak open HPSTR. We do a roll call and then open for general this things. So we'll co come back to you once we okay. finish the roll call. We have a lot of people tonight. Uh, next on the list is Bill, uh, AB4EJ. Go ahead, Bill. Thanks, Dave. Good evening to the net and uh, been, been fairly busy here. Um, I uh, worked on getting the fire hose local system working where you basically you give the data engine a, an IP address and a port and then uh, put it into fire hose local mode. And when you tell it to start collecting data, it just start, starts a raw feed of everything it collects on that channel uh, and sends it to that IP and that port. And so uh, I've been able to um, simulate that situation of that with a virtual machine and get the data engine just, just send everything it collects uh, directly to a fast server on the local area network. So uh, that, that is working. Uh, and I wrote up, well, I added a little bit to the specification. I realized on the spec, the data engine to local host uh, specification for that protocol, I realized I had a way to put it into fire hose mode, but not to take it out of fire hose mode. So I, uh, I added an additional thing uh, to take it out of fire hose mode and also to turn LEDs off. I had something to turn the LED on, but not to turn them off. So that was what you got today in the Tangerine data feed was a, an updated specification on that. Um, uh, Nathaniel, you should have received uh, the NASA pre-proposal <clears throat> with uh, Dr. Tra uh, Ad Atkinson's uh, inputs all included into it. So let me know what you, further you need on that. The other thing is I finally got my contest station working properly, worked ARRL sweeps this weekend. And I took um, the advice of some people just if you have a good station, just park on a frequency and call CQ. And I worked 1,120 QSOs 
and worked 82 of the 84 ARRL sections in North America uh, in over the course of, let me see, it was, it was a 30 hour contest and I was on for I think 22 hours. And um, Prince Edward Island and Newfoundland, uh, best I could tell, uh, they only worked a few contacts for a few lucky people and I was not one of them. So, but what are you gonna do? Um, I've only worked a sweep one time and that was in what, 19 or 2014. So we came this close to it this year. <laughs> Got to keep trying every year. Maybe we're, next year we'll work on limited and uh, use uh, spotting networks. And maybe I, I just worked class Bravo this year. So didn't use the spotting networks, networks, but maybe next year we'll try that and see what happens. Okay, back to net. Very good. And let's see, next on the list is Dan in for XWE. Go ahead, Dan. Uh, thank you, Dave, and good evening, everyone. Well, I'm sorry I missed last week. I uh, will spare everyone the details other than to say I, the stitches came out on Wednesday <laughs> of last week, and before that, I was not feeling all that great. So anyway, uh, <laughs> I did have a couple of comments. I listened to the uh, recording from last week, and um, I saw something on the Explaining Computers presentation that Chris Barnett did uh, this last week about thermal, uh, well, it was actually about cons power consumption on the Raspberry Pi 4. And he has a little stress test that he uses to exercise all four cores to max out the temperature on the Raspberry Pi 4. And he actually ran that and at idle, it was two watts. Running the stress test, it was four watts of power consumption. So I don't think we're gonna have a big problem with heat in the Raspberry Pi. It's going to have to have some sort of airflow, but I don't think it's gonna to have to be substantial. So anyway, I know there was some concern about that. And I think if you're interested to you know, go back and look at Chris's YouTube video from this last week, and you'll get a pretty good appreciation for what sort of power consumption single board computers have. Um, other than that, uh, I worked a little bit on a 3D model for uh, the Raspberry Pi 4 plus a Pi hat. I have something that I think will work. I don't have a hat right now, so I can't really check it, but uh, I do have something in the works. So we'll have a starting point at least and see where we can go from there. Anyway, back to you, Dave. Very good. And let's see, next on the list, we have David Lewis. Go ahead, David. Can we get back on? Good evening. Yep. Wall, Dave Lewis, W2HMT. Just interested in what all of you gentlemen and others are doing, especially in the magnetometer area. I thought my friend Jules might be on tonight, but I, I don't see him yet. But uh, anyway, back to Nat. He was here last week. So uh, so last week we got him and this week we get you. <laughs> Welcome. Got the better deal last week. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next on the list, we have uh, David McGaw in 1HAC. Go ahead. Hello, everyone. Um, received the uh, new uh, magnetometer boards today. Um, so looking forward to powering those up and uh, getting new software for them and all of that. And uh, as I pinged uh, John earlier today, I'm very interested in seeing the current state of the clock board and um, maybe being able to assist with it at some point. Um, I consider that a very important uh, component to the um, system so that we can be uh, running these uh, devices well synchronized and uh, do some array work. So back to Nat. Very good. Next on the list is Gary, AF8A. Go ahead, Gary. Yeah, good evening, everyone. I understand we're busy, so I'll turn it right back to Nat. Thank you. Very good. Uh, next on the net list is James uh, KG4DSG. Go ahead, James. 
uh, evening all. Um, just listening in, looking forward to the clock module discussion and back to the net. Very good. Uh, next on the list, we have Jim, uh, 7J1AJH. Welcome back. Hi, good. Thank you. Good morning. Nothing. Yes. Just want to follow along. Thanks. Very good. And then we have, let's see, I already called on John, uh, John Ackerman, uh, John N N8 OBJ. Go ahead. Yes. John Gibbons, N8 OBJ. Um, working on the low cost space weather station among five, five other things I got going. First thing I wanted to show is this is my modified board I put in for, this is going to a ninth grade student in Fort Collins, Colorado, who is going to be our frequency reference measurement station for the Doppler shift data. I've got his uh, FT817 modified to accept the Leo Bonar GPS DO so he has a, a decent clock so he can actually make the measurement. Uh, that's one project. Uh, the second thing that came along was Scotty's little board. And as you can see, this is the case that we use, uh, what is the camera there, that we use for mounting the thing on there. And when you plug the header on, I'm about 150 thousandths above the pins. <laughs> and it also, block, it also blocks the fans. So we're gonna have to work on that. The other problem I'm having is putting it into the ground. I have a one and a half inch PVC pipe and yes. the connector for the RJ45 interferes with it going in. Yep. So if we rotate that 90 degrees in the center, that'll fix that problem. Although on the low cost weather station, I am gonna have this connector on there. So maybe it might not be necessary. Well, Scotty, I'm gonna have to talk about that. Because um, if this is the one that's going in the ground, uh, it, it would be nice if we could rotate the RJ45 90 degrees because then it'll fit very nicely in the one and a half PVC pipe and you can use a two inch drill to put it down below the frost line. And right. in Cleveland here, that's three feet down. Uh, let's see, I'm also got, I'm making seven or eight, eight more of the low cost weather stations to be shipped out to different places, including Nathaniel. Um, got that all going, got the software update coming. I'm working on the mega data or the, the header data for Dave Witten. Uh, I got the files from Bill Engelke for the C code and I have to incorporate that to get that to work. Once I get that working, I get it to David and give him the Python script that generates the file structure for the entire weather station. And then the code that would be the boilerplate that I'm planning on using goes off, reads all that information and creates a header file for every day's data file. So that's all in the works. Uh, other than that, I'm not doing much of anything. Back yep. to that. Very good, John. Uh, next on the list, we have Nathan uh, Nathaniel. I think I already went. Oh, sorry, not Nathaniel, Jonathan. So Jonathan, KC3EEY, go ahead. Hi, everybody. Um, I do not have much to report. Uh, it is finals week here at the University of Scranton. Uh, I'm very busy at work. I'm very busy with, with uh, finals and uh, all the last work that has to be handed in. Uh, so I've been mainly doing that. Uh, but as soon as that's done, I could uh, mess around a little bit more with the um, uh, with my project. Um, the um, um, the uh, sixty one forty uh, the sixty one forty. Well, anyway, the application, the, the evaluation board came in uh, for the um, for the uh, uh, 6140 um, ADD converter, and it looks like 
um, that the clock is generated from the Exmos USB audio controller. Um, and uh, it also has a, uh, it looks like it has a, um, an audio output. Uh, it has a, a D to A converter for an audio output as well, uh, PCM 9211. Um, and I'm not really sure exactly why that they added that. I, I have to go through the manual. Um, but so, so um, as far as plans, what I wanted to do was uh, I wanted to um, uh, make this uh, work not only as a Raspberry Pi sound card, but a sound card for, for the Tangerine SDR. Um, so I will be using a separate crystal for the Raspberry Pi sound card um, and the programmable clock from the Tangerine SDR. Uh, so I'm interested to hear about the progress of the clock module. Uh, that's, uh, that's all I have for now. Back to the net. Very good. Next on the list, we have Kevin B. Go ahead, Kevin. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Uh, brand new general uh, operator just passed my test um, Saturday and, um, had local net on, uh, Sunday and they mentioned this organization. So I'm just here to kind of see what it's all about. Well, uh, we're developing radios and so, uh, building them from scratch. Uh, and so welcome and hopefully you got some engineering skills can help build things. I will okay. be starting electrical engineering degree in the summer. Oh, very good. Okay, and next on the list, we have Michael, A-A-A-K. Go ahead, Michael. Dave, greetings to everyone on the list. Today I got my Cat Cat 6 cable, and it even tests, it rings out okay. <laughs> so Very good. Uh, nice. Look, looking forward to uh, planting that uh, as soon as the weather <laughs> improves a bit. Back to you, Dave. Good. And uh, next we have Jules. Go ahead, Jules. Hello, one, two, three. I might be on. I think I'm uh, unmuted now. Yes, you're unmuted. Okay, great. Just got Scotty's. I just saw her a little late. I had to help my daughter with a fixture she's making for her piano technician work. Anyway, uh, Scotty's boards arrived, uh, and I just picked them out of the mail about 45 minutes ago. Haven't opened the box yet, but I'm looking forward to doing that. I have a uh, two, a dual mag um, <clears throat> embedded unit in service currently. I put it in over the weekend, down to a depth of 30 inches, and I'm working with Dave to just go over some software issues. But everything seems to be working properly, and looking forward to making those direct comparisons as the two units are about four inches apart. Uh, other than that, I'm hoping to use Scotty's boards and get another mag going by the end of the next weekend and try to get that in the ground as well. That's it from here. Okay, very good. And let's see, it's Scotty is the next, WA2 DFI. Go ahead, Scotty. Okay, Dave, uh, thanks and uh, good evening, everyone. Um, sorry, Dave, you got a <laughs> magnetometer that didn't work. I, I tested every one, but I did not stream data from every one. I merely tested yep. to see if they responded to addresses. So it did respond to addresses. Yep. And it so, was uh, boards seven and eight. Okay. For your record. Uh, but since you put your uh, a new magnetometer in, it worked, right? Yeah. When I took the magnetometer I already had in, which yeah. I've been running for four months now. So. <laughs> Uh, okay, I knew well, it worked. <laughs> well, check the headers and see if I messed up and didn't solder one of the pins. That might be one, one thing. Yeah. Other than that, if it's a bad one, we should swap it out with another one. Okay. I have a few spares that uh, we bought. So, okay. um, And this week has been like uh, happened to Dave Witten, a couple uh, 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 high priority uh, previous contracts came out of the woodwork, which required some work. So 
And so I had to try to get that out of the way so that we can clear the slate for the new stuff coming up, which is coming up pretty fast here. And I exchanged a few emails with Tom and John on the clock module. So looking forward to seeing uh, that presentation too. So we won't take any more time. Back to you, Dave. Okay. And we're down to Tom. Tom? Okay. Last and least this week. Extremely busy week. Unfortunately, none of it on the, on the project. Learned how to bring up a Kubernetes cluster. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh, I, I had a little fun with those, too. And uh, I, The trouble is, I learned a bunch of it, and then... Uh, after not using it for a while, I forgot a bunch, so I have to relearn it. <laughs> so anyway, I think the, the talk of the night that is top of the list is John's talk on the, uh, the clock module. So we'll let John talk for a bit. Okay, well, just to, to, to kick it off, um, yeah, we've been working on this for quite some time with the idea of building a more or less traditional GPS DO, uh, GPS disciplined oscillator, but with a couple of tweaks that might have let us knock a little bit of cost out and uh, simplify the design. But about, uh, I don't know, a month ago now, I had one of these brainstorms and it's ended up with a 90 degree turn uh, that's knocked a tremendous amount of cost and simplicity out of the design. And uh, it's going to work. I've been, I've been able to breadboard it enough that, that we're, I think we're very confident it'll function. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the, the general introduction to what we're trying to do um, and then what this new possibility is and how, how we'll get there. And then I've got some performance data. Uh, you all know me, so you know that I will talk to fill the available time. So uh, you know, feel free to tell me to move along okay. uh, or to uh, or to spend more time on something and less time on something else. So I will share the screen if I can. And I think this should be the presentation. Are you seeing? Yes. OK. So um, and this started out as a presentation I gave uh, at uh, DCC. Uh, actually, might have even been at, at uh, yeah, as DCC was the most recent. Um, so these are the, these are the uh, requirements that we had for the Tangerine SDR clock. Basically, we need the 122.88 meg uh, clock to drive the RF modules. We also wanted pulse per second and timestamps uh, to be able to do data tagging. Hopefully, a, a general purpose 10 meg reference signal. We'd like the GPS module to be able to also provide uh, the, the raw data that's required to get total electron count measurements uh, for uh, space science experiments. And then spe specifications were challenging because I don't think anybody on the science side really knows the full scope of what we might want to do with this thing. So after a lot of conversation, I sort of pulled out of uh, the air um, a, a set of specs that so far people seem to be happy with, and I hope that they are sufficient. Uh, the first is the, that the long-term frequency accuracy is within one uh, part in, uh, per trillion, one in 10 to the minus 12th, that the stability, how much it wiggles around in the short term is one part per billion or better, um, that the pulse per second timing accuracy is within 100 nanoseconds, and the jitter on that is less than 10 nanoseconds. And then finally, the phase noise, which is important for the RF application, uh, we pulled out a couple of numbers for uh, uh, the different offsets from the carrier of minus 80 at 100 hertz and minus 150 at 100 kilohertz, um, which I'm hoping we'll be able to meet. Those are probably the, the most challenging uh, specs uh, in the design that we have uh, uh, in progress. So the, the, summarizing the, what we've already talked about, uh, the basic idea behind a GPS disciplined oscillator is that the GPS signal coming out of the, the module has extremely good long-term accuracy and long-term frequency stability, but there's a lot of jitter on that the pulse per second that comes out. And you can't 
to directly lock that to a crystal because it bounces around too much. So you use a phase lock loop and have a crystal oscillator that you can almost think of as a flywheel. Uh, that is, that's the crystal oscillator is running at 10 megahertz and it's an oven or temperature controlled. And uh, its signal is uh, divided down uh, and compared to the uh, pulse per second coming from the GPS and you very slowly steer the crystal to keep it in sync. And the goal is that you want to get to match where the worsening performance of the crystal over time because it drifts and wanders around matches the improving performance of the GPS over time as the jitter becomes a smaller component and design the thing so that you can meet that, that crossover point. And this plot shows kind of how that works. The green is a somewhat typical um, oscillator. It's in this case, a, a, a temperature controlled crystal oscillator at 125 megahertz. And the, the violet trace is a, is a really, really, really good modern GPS. Um, the violet or the blue trace is a cheap, more traditional GPS. Uh, and you can see what happens where the, the Allen deviation crosses over. And again, to summarize, Allen deviation is kind of how much statistically we would expect the signal to wander around between subsequent measurements taken at the time interval shown on the x-axis. So what this is saying is that if we take a sample every second of the, of the oscillator, we will statistically see that it's got noise on it of roughly uh, uh, one part in 10 to the 10th or uh, 100 picoseconds uh, from uh, second to second measurements. And if we look out here at uh, 100 seconds, now we have about uh, 50 nanoseconds of jitter second to second. So that's kind of what this plot is, is showing. It's log scale with the stability on the y-axis and the, the measurement time on the x-axis. So what we want to do is have a phase lock loop that tries to hit these crossover points so that in the short term, we get the good performance of the crystal. And in the long term, we get the good performance of the GPS. That's the, that's the whole goal, goal of the thing. So traditionally, you'd have a GPS that's got a pulse per second coming out, and then your 10 megahertz, either temperature controlled, crystal controlled oscillator, divide that down to pulse per second, you have a phase detector that looks at the difference between the two, and a feedback loop with a, with a phase lock loop that will steer the crystal so that its pulse per second stays locked to uh, the GPS pulse with a very long time constant to get rid of the jitter. In a traditional GPS DO, the time constant might be anywhere from 100 to 1,000 seconds. So we're relying on the, on the oscillator for that short term for several hundred seconds. And then gradually, we transition to being controlled by the GPS signal. Um, and then some added things that you'd like to have a holdover capability. So if the GPS goes away, you still have a usable signal um, uh, coming out. And as a sub part of that, um, you'd like to learn about how the, uh, the crystal is aging and how its temperature sensitivity works so that you can compensate for that when it's in free running mode. And finally, you might have a variable loop, loop bandwidth so that it's faster to acquire. If you think about a loop that's got a thousand second time constant, it can take an awful long time for that to lock in. So you might have a fast loop at the beginning and then uh, once it acquires it, go to the slower loop. And so you end up with this kind of traditional architecture uh, GPS engine going into a time interval counter and uh, 10 megahertz divided by 10 to the seventh going into the time interval counter. You get a difference output that feeds into a microprocessor that steers a, a digital to analog converter, which steers the crystal oscillator to keep everything so that this time interval remains constant over time. And that's the traditional uh, design that we were originally thinking of using uh, for the clock uh, module with, with a few tweaks. Um, the question came up whether these new GPS modules that are out would let us do better. And my original thinking was, if there's less jitter on the GPS pulse per second, that means we can have a shorter loop time constant. That means that maybe we can have a shorter, uh, rather we, have, we can 
use a cheaper crystal because it doesn't need to be stable for as long a time period. If we have a 10 second loop constant, the performance of the crystal beyond you know that 10 to 20 or 30 seconds doesn't really matter. So the, uh, what I wanted to do was test some of these newer modules to see whether they would give us an improvement. And they do. This, uh, this chart again is Allen deviation uh, and it's the raw pulse per second output of three uh, GPS modules. Uh, the green is an is a U blocks M9N, which is a cheap, it's about a $15 unit. Uh, the violet is the uh, Neo MAT, which is a, a single frequency timing receiver. And you, it looks actually like it's worse than the Neo in this plot, but uh, for practical purposes, they're really about identical. There's very little difference between the two. But the, the blue line is the dual frequency uh, receiver that uh, Ublox recently released. And you can see it is substantially better. So I thought, aha, that is goodness. We can use the fancier receiver to get lower noise, have a, uh, a uh, faster loop constant, and we could have a cheaper crystal. So that was the original design idea. And this was the original design of the clock module, which has a, a big FPGA in the middle that does all the hard work. And it acts kind of like a switch bus. And we have a GPS uh, signal, which doesn't actually show up um, on, on here for some reason in this plot. But over in this corner where, there, where there's blank space, there should be a box <laughs> that, that says GPS. And it's sending its pulse per second out uh, uh, to the FPGA. We have a, a crystal oscillator uh, over here that's generating a 10 megahertz output. And that goes into the FPGA where it's divided down uh, to pulse per second. Uh, we have a, a phase detector which is actually uh, uh, a chip that I used in the tick time interval counter uh, that's, that's measuring the time difference between the two pulse per seconds uh, and outputting a value that can be used by the control loop to steer them. And then uh, the uh, FPGA then outputs uh, to a DAC which steers the, the crystal. And then uh, we, saw, we further lock that uh, because that's 10 megahertz, but we need 122.88. So we now have a uh, uh, 122.88 megahertz crystal that we, uh, that we lock to the 10 megahertz. Again, kind of going through the FPGA, a four-way buffer, and that gives us the outputs that the tangerine needs. So that was the original design. It was cool. It was very flexible. Um, it would allow us to do lots of other things, but still fairly complicated and we would have to write all the code that sits inside the FPGA uh, to actually to be the the uh, uh, control algorithm and I wasn't really looking forward to doing that. So I then kind of put together a couple of the different uh, measurements that I had done uh, and, I, and I went through all this in more detail at the DCC and I've got other papers that I can point you to if, if you're interested in, in more background. But so taking the ZF9T, which is the best fancy new expensive uh, GPS module, this is its raw pulse per second performance, which ain't bad. Uh, but the receiver can output a it's called a, a quantization error message or Q error message that tells me that the next hardware pulse that comes out is going to be 4.2 nanoseconds slow against GPS. And I can then compensate for that in software. And this violet plot shows what happens when I do that. And you see things get a whole lot better. And this is what I was counting on to let me be able to use a cheap uh, crystal because I can do the, the error correction and get down here to, to a very nice performance, about five and 10 to the 10th at one second with just the raw uh, GPS uh, with, by applying that software correction. So that's what all that design that I just showed you was based on uh, the idea. But as part of the testing that I did, was these new GPS modules, they've got an output that's called time pulse. And traditionally we set that to one pulse per second. 
Well, these things can be set for up to 25 megahertz output. So I thought, what if I set the time pulse to 10 megahertz? Uh, and what kind of output would I get from that? And that's what happens, uh, the green line, which is incredible. Um, we're down at one second at actually parts in 10 to the 11th in this measurement. It go, this measurement was done separately and it actually goes to the left hand uh, uh, limit is 0 0.1 seconds. So one second, here's where the other plots stop. But you can see in the short term, we're significantly better yet. And this is a raw output from the GPS. I don't need to process any data messages or anything. And this is easily good enough to meet the performance requirements of, that we have for the tangerine. The problem is, that the phase noise of this 10 megahertz signal coming out of the, the uh, uh, GPS is awful. Uh, this is a plot of, of phase noise um, with decibels down from the carrier on the left and the offset from the carrier on the right. And remembering that we want to be down in the uh, uh, minus 150 area, ideally when we get out here, we're more like minus 100. It's just and there's spurs and it's just, it's ugly because that 10 megahertz is being generated by some kind of a DDS or numerically controlled oscillator. And it's being jerked around by the, by the updates from the, the GPS engine. Uh, so it's just, it, it's not very good. And the inset in the lower left is maybe more intuitive. This is a spectrum analyzer plot with the black line being the noise, uh, the spectrum from the, the GPS, the green line being a pretty good quality signal generator. So you can see the noise sidebands that are, that are here. So the bottom line is you cannot put that 10 megahertz signal on the air. Uh, the, the phase noise and, and spurs on it would just be horrible. So we can't directly use the 10 megs, but I had previously been in for a different project looking at a chip that Silicon Labs makes. It's called a jitter attenuator. And it's designed for telecom systems where you think about a cabinet where you've got a master clock signal that's going to drive a whole bunch of cards. And those cards are need to, to come up with different frequencies and they also need to be very clean. And when you're distributing your master clock around the, the rack, it's gonna pick up noise and, and stuff. Well, these chips are designed uh, to provide that cleanup. And uh, the block diagram on the right is, I probably don't need to, need to go into all the details, but uh, it has four clock inputs that you can set to any frequency that you want between eight kilohertz and 750 megahertz. And uh, a, a PLL system that can generate any output from 100 hertz to a little bit over one gigahertz. And the part that I've got shown in red here, there's a separate crystal oscillator up here that provides uh, the, the signal source for this PLL. And the idea is that this crystal oscillator is very low noise and it's in driving the PLL and it filters out all the crud that's on the inputs from uh, coming from the master clock. So my thought was, geez, why don't we take that ugly 10 megs coming out of the GPS, shove it into here and, and not only clean it up, but also convert it to whatever frequencies we want. We have four outputs and we can program those to anything we want. So three of them can be 122.88 to drive Tom's uh, RF modules, or alternatively, we can make four of them be each one kilohertz offset from a WWV frequency uh, to drive the grapes receiver, uh, to provide clocking for that. All we need to do is, is program it. Uh, so in one chip, we basically have a complete discipline oscillator with uh, our, our, the equivalent of the GPS coming in over here, the equivalent of, of the 10 megahertz over here, it's actually 40 megs in this case, and then frequency translation to get whatever we want. So that means we can have a really simple system. Uh, the GPS module plus this chip is about $15 in quantity, and the crystal oscillator we're going to be using is about $17 in quantity. So, you know, we got 
add some other stuff, less than $50 in parts cost uh, for a the most basic system, uh, which is way cheaper than the other design we were working on. Uh, the phase noise from this chip is very good. It's not quite as good as I would ideally like that 150 uh, dB down at, at 100 kilohertz, that was our goal. Here, we're actually more in the minus 140 range. So it's not quite what we want. And by the way, this plot is not something that's directly from, from my data. It's something uh, from one of their app notes. And I, I'm showing it just to show kind of or directionally what the phase noise looks like. Um, but we think that this is still good enough for all of our RF applications to have the minus 140 to 100 kilohertz and down uh, below 160 when you get out to a megahertz and beyond. So pretty pretty good phase noise. Now, the, the local crystal, the 40 megahertz, can be either a bare crystal or a TCXO. And... Uh, I, the evaluation board for this chip that I have has just the bare crystal. And if we look at the short-term stability of that, that's the blue line. Remember, my target is to always be uh, one in 10 to the ninth of part per billion or better. This doesn't quite make it. But there's a similar board, uh, earlier generation chip that does more or less the same thing. And that evaluation board comes with a TCXO on it. So with that board, even though it's not quite the same chip, I can see what the performance looks like in short term with the TCXO. And that's the violet line. But we're down here in the range of, of 3 and 10 to the 10th at one second. And then out here is where the GPS starts to take over. So look only at this before it starts sloping downhill. This is way better than the, the part per billion spec that we had. So with the TCXO, the short-term stability will, will do everything uh, that we wanted. So this is the Mark II uh, uh, clock module. And it's also somewhat chopped off. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not very good at these graphics. Let me see if I escape out of here. Um, I'm going to, to go elsewhere to show you this picture because this didn't come through the way we had hoped it would. Now, even this didn't come through. That's interesting. It chopped stuff off. So my apologies, but basically over here uh, on the very right-hand end is the 72-pin connector that... John, um, yes. You need... It's sharing... I'm getting your picture. Okay. Um, okay. I've only got it sharing. Okay. Never mind. Let me let me go back to the slideshow. Is it? Um, which is still showing as much. So you should see it now. I'm seeing you. <laughs> it, it stopped it. Huh? It stopped sharing. I'm weird. Yeah. Sometimes weird, it weird. does that. You have to stop it and start it manually. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. There you are. Okay. Okay. So this is this is the Mark II, and the bottom of it's chopped off. So I, I apologize for that. You're not missing too much. But over here on the far right hand side is the 74 pin or 75 pin or 76 pin or whatever it is connector that Scotty is using uh, uh, to uh, interface the module to the data engine. This is this Silicon Lab synthesizer chip the 48 megahertz TCXO, the opportunity to plug in an external reference. So if somebody's already got a good GPS DO or a cesium clock or whatever, they can use that instead of, of the GPS. Um, then the GPS module, which is sending 10 megahertz into the synthesizer chip, one pulse per second out to the rest of the system and also the, the, the GPS data out to the rest of the system on this connector. And that's the part that's chopped off, I'm, I'm sorry to say. Uh, but so this is basically the entire system uh, with, with the two main modules, the GPS and the uh, Silicon Labs chip plus the TCXO. And the other thing that's really cool about this is there is no programming. 
uh, because this, <laughs> the SI chip does everything. There's a, a software program that Silicon Labs uh, makes available that you tell it what frequencies go in and what frequencies come out and what kind of bandwidth you want to use for the loop. And it generates the registers uh, to program it. And then you upload the registers into the chip at boot time and it starts doing it. So our uh, code development time drops to basically nil uh, with this. So um, it's, this is a really cool idea. And the question is, how well does it work in practice? Well, because I've got the GPS module and I've got the evaluation board, I was able to do a set of tests. And, oh, I'll, let me back up one. We're, we're, we're thinking of having four different versions potentially of the, of the board. Uh, a base version that has no GPS at all. So it requires the external frequency reference. This might be more interesting to the time nuts uh, than to the space science group. Um, a bronze version that uses a, a, a module, a GPS that's $14 in 100 unit quantity. So really, really cheap. Um, the only problem with it is its RF performance isn't quite as good as you'll see, but it does only has one pulse output which means that if we use that pulse to generate the 10 megahertz, um, we don't get a pulse per second. So if you go with the bronze version, uh, we won't get timing out of it, but we will still get pretty good frequency. Then the silver uses uh, the older generation timing chip, a little bit better RF, RF performance. It has the second output, so we get the pulse per second and the timing information. It's 52 bucks. And then finally, the dual frequency was, gives us the best RF performance, gives us PPS. It also has the raw data to generate the total electron count. And that thing is 100 bucks more expensive. It's 155 and $100 quantity. But uh, we can plug any of these chips out of the same board. We'll have footprints that support all three. So uh, there'll, there'll be a, a range of performance capabilities. And by the way, for, uh, uh, for uh, John's um, benefit, I've been saying all along that we, we get 10 megahertz out of the GPS module. And I know we would like to not have any 10 meg signals running around that might interfere with WWV uh, for the grapes unit. Well, nothing says that we can't use 10.1 or 25 or 24.99 uh, as that uh, clock frequency. So we can move the clock frequency to something that's not going to generate any interference with any of the science applications. So I just wanted to make sure that uh, that, that was known uh, that we can work around uh, that issue. So um, these are the three modules, the bronze, uh, silver and gold. This is just the raw performance of the GPS by itself, the, the stability. And you can see the blue is the cheap one. The, the violet is the uh, uh, middle uh, silver one. And the green is the dual frequency gold. And these are noticeable differences. Whether these are differences that anyone cares about is a different question because they're all at one second offset much better than one part per billion. <laughs> so John, the, the green one is the only one that will have the TEC, right? Correct. Right. So the, the, the trade-offs are depending on the science application, which, mo which uh, GPS module you would want. Uh, but but that's, the, that's the raw performance. Now, this is the performance uh, coming through the synthesizer chip. And again, this is using a, a, the different older chip, the 5328, we're going to use a 5344. The reason for this is that this evaluation board has the TCXO rather than the crystal oscillator. So here um, we, we can see what we're really getting out of the system with a loop bandwidth with a time constant of about 15 seconds or so uh, of, of the, the, the PLL uh, loop bandwidth. The blue is the, uh, the cheap one. And you'll see there's some interesting wiggling around here in the at the very short term uh, at a second and below that could cause potentially maybe some motorboating type effects depending on how far down they are from the carrier. Um, but either the mid range or the silver 
or I'm sorry, the silver or the gold are both very clean. We're down in the two to three parts and 10 to the minus 10th and a nice tail off. This is, again is where the GPS takes over. Uh, so we get really nice performance uh, out of this for uh, the stability purposes, well in excess of our specification. Uh, here's the phase noise. Um, and again, this is a different chip. It's a little bit earlier design. Um, and it's um, with the TCXO that's probably not optimized for ideal phase noise performance. But what you can see here is that at 100 kilohertz, we're down at about minus 135. So that's five or six dB worse than, than the uh, uh, plots uh, that I showed before. I think we can make some of that up in our hardware design. Um, as we get out at 100 hertz, we're down at, at minus 110. At 10 hertz, we're in the minus 90 range. So that's, that's all nicely tracking our spec. You'll see there, there are a few spurs. Um, and again, the cheap unit has more spurs than, than the fancier ones, but they're still not too bad at all. I've seen much, much worse than this from a lot of synthesizers. So this, this is a pretty usable RF spectrum. Now, this is interesting with, with Allen deviation, but I was taking a thousand samples a second. So looking at the left side, this is, this is a, a measurement interval of, of one millisecond, 10 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds, a second, 10, 100. And you see this interesting ringing showing up at the very short term in all of them, but it goes from a whole bunch on the cheapest unit to significantly less on the uh, uh, mid-range range. And again, the, the F9, much, much better um, at anything except the very shortest term. So again, there's, there is a little bit of, of, of noise performance that might show up as a, you know, subhertz kind of jitter uh, with cheaper units. Uh, but I believe that these will all still be uh, within uh, you know, useful range. It's not going to cause any problems in the real world, something that only shows up on, on laboratory instruments, I hope. Except, except so do you have an explanation of what, why that oscillates like that? Um, it's most likely uh, some kind of truncation in the DDS or whatever they're using to generate the 10 meg output. And if you look at it, it it's sort of harmonic. If you go from here, we're, we're at roughly 0.15. This is roughly 0.23, roughly 0.4. This is roughly 0.8. This is 1.2. So you, you get a sense that there's, there's maybe a uh, you know, 400 millisecond thing going on in in the uh, in the output and I think the, the magic is the, the more expensive units have faster clocks so they probably have a cleaner uh, again DDS or whatever they're using as their uh, signal generator probably a bit cleaner because it's clocking faster now um, let's see sorry uh, that is yeah, as that you was say, a, it's basically it's time slow. quantization. Yeah, yeah. Now, this, here's the phase noise um, impact of, of, and this is a little bit different view. This is looking at, and let me go back one. Um, I, I think I, I, unfortunately, I think I got a slide mi mixed up. This, sh this should have been a different slide, which would be very cool to show you. Uh, I'll go back over here to the, to the phase noise. Um, this blue, again, th these are all the F9T, the expensive unit. This is the phase noise of the raw 10 megahertz. Green is the phase noise with about a two hertz loop bandwidth. And you see it's the floor is about the same, but you see more spurs here. The violet is the uh, 0 0.088, uh, or 15 second or so uh, bandwidth where the spurs are almost completely gone. So for optimum performance, we want to pick a bandwidth and, th and this is programmed when you configure the chip, there's about uh, a dozen bandwidth options that you can select to get the 
a short time constant, uh, but still good enough to filter out all the crud to get the clean phase noise. So, um, and I had, I had meant to show a, an ADEV plot showing the difference between uh, the two uh, different uh, bandwidths for the, the stability where the, the narrower bandwidth um, is actually worse for this receiver uh, than the wide one because the, the receiver is so good. We just have to have enough filtering to get rid of the phase noise. So that is about it. I could, I could switch over and show you some, play around with some live uh, plots, but I don't think we really need to do that um, because I've, I've got most of what I wanted to show um, in the slides. So I will stop sharing and I will be happy to answer questions or just shut up. Actually, I have a, I have a question for you. Um, the low cost grape system, I was planning on using the one PPS and the NEMA stream out of it to actually run the Linux system clock as a stratum one reference. Would I have that accessible to me with your design that I could also do that? Yeah. Yes, if you use the, well, two answers. Uh, y yes, if you use the cheapest GPS module, the $15 one, you can get the NEMA stream, but it only has one time pulse output. And we're using that output for the 10 megahertz. So we can't get a pulse per second. If if getting the the um, NEMA mark by itself is good enough, you you would have that available. If you if you want to have a hardware pulse per second, you need to, to go to the middle receiver that that has two outputs where one of them can be PPS. So that would give you NEMA and a hardware pulse per second as well as the 10 meg. So uh, well, it depends on on how, what you need, which module you'd have to use. Yeah, actually, if you're generating the one PPS from somewhere else in the string, we could use that for it. it doesn't have to come straight out. Well, the, the, the problem is we're, we're, we only have a single pulse output from the module. That okay. pulse output is running at 10 megahertz. I can divide that back down to one hertz, but I have no idea where the top of the second is. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. So it sounds so, like the intermediate one is probably the one I'd be shooting for. Yeah, I, uh, unless just the ASCII stream alone is close enough for what you need to do. Yeah, it's not looking for much, but that's, yeah. I don't know whether it would be or not. We'll find out. Um, yeah. Yeah. Dave Witten, if you could uh, uh, mute, we're getting a mouse coming through your microphone. I can hear yeah. some squeaking of him with <laughs> twisting uh, PVC pipe. <laughs> <laughs> Um, John, I've got a couple of comments yeah. in that this all looks um, very good, but from a uh, ideal world standpoint, and in a real world, this isn't going to be always that good. Um, if you lose a GPS lock, for instance, you're going to need something that's a good reference to hold well, over. You, so this lose... doesn't show any holdover. Uh, and and I, I, I didn't mention that there is holdover built into the chip and it's not incredibly sophisticated, but it, it will record, I think, up to a couple of minutes of prior history and apply that to hold the frequency uh, during a loss of, of external clock. So yeah. it'll, it'll run with the stability of the TCXO when there's no right. GPS present. But that may not be adequate um, during but nothing the would. holdover. Yeah. I mean, um, the, other, the other part of it is that uh, I'd be very nervous running from just a bare crystal. Right, uh, and we're not. Because, well, it has to be at least a TCXO and a right. pretty good one. Yeah. Because, um, you know, real world in the winter when the furnace comes on and you got cold air and warm air blowing past this thing, Right. It's going to be all over the place. Yeah. Although remember, that's only affecting it in in this in this few second time range. But you're but you are right that the the raw crystal doesn't meet the spec that that I had set for it. The TCXO is almost an order of magnitude better than the spec, and with a little bit of thermal management to keep 
drafts you know directly from blowing on the chip i i think will be well within the the design margin using the tcxo the problem right. is this is getting down a rat hole a little bit but Silicon Labs recommends for the best possible face noise performance, they want you to use the bare crystal. With the TCXO, they warn that the jitter will not be quite as good. I've talked to their engineers and we have a bit that we can do uh, with conditioning the TCXO signal that we may be able to re re reduce yeah. the amount of that disadvantage. Yeah, that's an interesting trade-off. Um, yeah. I, I think it's because with the crystal, um, the, the oscillator is, is internal and it's and it's directly feeding the differential, or it's, it's directly feeding the internal clock. When you're using um, an external source, it's single-ended going into what is intended to be a differential input. Right, right. And so what we're going to do is that there is a chip that linear technology makes that is designed to convert sine wave to differential uh, LV Peckle output. Mm -hmm. So we think that by using that chip in between, maybe we can get rid of some of that noise disadvantage. And the Silicon Labs engineer sort of nodded his head yes when I, when I talked about doing that. So <laughs> we'll see if it really makes a difference or not. Yeah, that's a very interesting. I'm also wondering in the Silicon Labs chip, do they have give you any control over loop bandwidth? Yes. Yeah, the, the loop bandwidth um, ranges from four kilohertz down to, uh, and it, it actually depends, it changes a little bit depending on the frequencies you're using. It's kind of weird, but for the 10 meg test that I was doing, the minimum bandwidth is 0 0.088 hertz, which is, you know, if you think about it in terms of seconds, that's maybe a, yeah. a 15 second or so time constant. Yeah. I want to see that electrolytic capacitor in there. No, oh, it's digital. It's it's <laughs> a yeah. It's it, and that's what's interesting. You when the way this thing works is you you have their clock builder software. You tell it the input frequencies, the output frequencies, what format you want for the you know, differential whatever, and then part of the steps is you can select the loop bandwidth. You can also select the. Um, a fast acquire. If so, if you're using a mm -hmm. very narrow loop, you can have it start up with a fast lock. But it gives you. I, I think there are 16 choices, probably because mm -hmm. it's it's a it's an eight bit um, or a four whatever. Right. Um, but they they said the a actual numbers change a little bit depending on what other variables you've plugged in. But it's in that range from four kilohertz to 0 0.088, and it's it's purely digital. Yep. Well, it's certainly worth uh, prototyping and working yeah. with it, but it looks like the uh, phase noise is a, a bit higher than we were trying to target, about by 10 times higher. Well, it, it's the, the tests that I've done now, I don't think are as good as we will get because I'm also taking the output single-ended uh, right. the thing, it's, et cetera. It's, it's not going to be at the 150 that we were hoping, but, um, and Tom uh, McDermott, if you want to jump in, I'd love it. We, we've talked about the actual requirement. And remember, this is minus 140 at 122 megahertz. We're going to be effectively dividing that down as we go into the HF range. We'll pick up sure. something in the, in the 10 to 20 dB range of, uh, by by the divide by the division, and so Tom, correct me if I'm lying about that. No, that's correct. The HD converter, when it takes ten or fifteen samples, is going to average average that across, you know, at ten megahertz, one twelfth of the clock. So it it should improve at a lower frequency. Yep. Oh, and John, one thing, one very simple way of doing a single-ended to differential. Um, conversion on a clock and very often done is a transformer. Yeah, I've got it. So backing up a little bit to the design course, Silicon Labs has a nice evaluation board um, and it's got SMAs for the pair for pairs for the outputs and SMAs for the inputs. And I can unsolder the crystal and SMAs for the TCXO if I want to put it on. So um, arriving Friday from China, uh, is a couple of circuit boards that I laid out 
with matching SMAs. So one, one of them is a transformer and a ballon for mm -hmm. the output side. The other is uh, a TCXO with the uh, single to differential chip for the input side or for the, for the ref, jitter reference side. So with those pieces, I should be able to prototype pr pretty closely to what the, the final system will look like. Mm -hmm without having to, to lay out the whole thing. So it's, uh, I'm, I'm, but given the results that we've had so far, I'm really confident that with the possible exception of the, the edges around the phase noise, um, it's going to do everything we want for a dramatically lower cost and mm -hmm. uh, a much simpler design. Now, are you feeding it the uncompensated um, pulse per second or yeah. whichever in? So you're not using the sawtooth correction. Right, and that's that's what's kind of amazing. Let me, if I can find the right slide. Yeah, this. Um, no, that's not the right one. Oh, down. Actually, John, while you're looking for that, I want to throw something out here. When I was at Keithley Instruments, the last GMM I worked on, which was their seventy-five ten, had a crystallized voltage reference that I designed the oven for. And it basically used eight resistors, a temperature sensor, and a, an op amp for a, a PID loop. And we were able to measure, maintain, you know, plus or minus a tenth of a degree on this ovenized thing. And the oven was only about a half inch by an inch, and it was four layers of copper. And you couple the, the thing to the copper plane, and you put a little box around it, so it would, it would maintain the temperature. What would that gain you? If you were to do that to the TCXO crystal, would it be thought, any significant advantage or not worth the time? I, I thought a little bit about it, and it might be helpful for a system that's that's being exposed to temperature excursions. Mm -hmm. um, my only concern is that this is a very small board, and the TCXO is actually bigger than the synthesizer chip. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, but the, the synthesizer chip makes a fair bit of heat so i'm a little bit concerned about what whether we could get a, the thermals working so that we can heat the uh, tcxo to a constant temperature and not have either the heat from the chip impacting it or or the, or the chip overheating because of the proximity of the oven. Well, I can show That's, you some neat tricks that I played with routing on the board that I routed all four edges so that the heat transfer in had to go through a really long path. And the board was basically completely isolated from the PC board right in the middle of it. So mm -hmm. it's dual. I'd, be, I'd certainly be interested in, in thinking about doing that. Okay. I don't, as I said, I don't think we need it for, okay. the, for, the, for the base case, but if we can do it, it's cool. Yeah, I, I, I don't have any problems with the idea. Um, I'm going to share again and again what, what's the thing that's that's um, remarkable about uh, okay okay got it yep okay so again this this was earlier in the, in the presentation the blue line is just the raw uh, pulse per second coming out of the uh, uh, the the ZF9 the dual frequency module, the violet is the the error correction, which makes a big difference. You know, it's an order of magnitude improvement. But I had no idea that the 10 megahertz output would be way better out. You know, to 50 seconds or so. And then I think if 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 we're doing apples to apples measurements, because the 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 green line was a little bit different measurement setup than the other two. Um, it would track identically probably from, from you know, 50 or 60 seconds on out. But shorter than that, the, the raw 10 megahertz is way better than the corrected pulse per second. And I, that just blew me away when I saw it. And, and that's why I kind of you know, put on the brakes and, and went back and started from scratch because this is just yes, it was, it was an better. incredible uh, result. Simpler is better. That's impressive. Yeah. Uh, so... Um, I don't. I don't. I know that's quite frequency well. dependent. If you took it up to twenty-five megahertz, if you get a little more improvement. Well, th that's a really good point, and I, I already have about fifteen variables that I can <laughs> use multiple <laughs> combinations of. Yeah. <laughs> but but at some point, I, I want to do at least gross level testing of you know 
100 kilohertz versus one versus 10 versus 25. And then also an integer frequency like 10 versus 11.11111 to see whether there's there are more spurs generated or, or other bad things that happen with with, yeah, with uh, the number dividing and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. those are those are further tests to be done, but uh, it's been hard enough uh, figuring out uh, how the loop bandwidth plays into uh, the both the the stability and the phase noise across the three different receivers. But I think you stumbled onto something that is very significant for the simplicity of it. It's it's that's incredible. Yeah. You get yeah. four old stars and go home early card. John. So, John, does this um, attenuate the jitter of the pulse per second as well as the RF? No, um, because what what we are doing is it's the the output pulse that would normally be pulse per second. We're telling the GPS to output ten megahertz instead of one pulse per second. Right. So you're so, losing the the accuracy of the one pulse per second and there are applications we're going to want that well, the, as accurate as well as having low right, phase noise right the the cheapest gps module only has one pulse output so if you use the 15 dollar module you don't get pulse per second but either of the other two modules have two pulse outputs so one of them is the 10 meg the other is the pulse per second yep so John, going back to uh, the phase noise requirements, it, it, could we could we say perhaps that the personal space weather station is not going to be as demanding on phase noise requirements as say a high performance HF receiver? Is that is that a, a correct statement or is no? I I don't know the answer to that. Tom would have a much better answer, but but I also would would say. I suspect that the performance that we'll get with this chip is probably as good as just about any of the Japanese or Texas radios that are currently out well, there. The well, point I wanted to make though was if you're if you're really concerned with phase noise above everything else, above and and maybe above even making TEC measurements, then we can make a different clock module that has low phase noise if that's what if there's an application for it. If yeah. not, then you can use one of these and it will be fine. Yeah, really, you know, the, there's there's a bunch of different kinds of measurements. And so there's some cases where L and deviation is very important. There's other applications where phase noise is important. So John's juggling about 20 variables here. John, to go back to David's question um, on the dual uh, pulse output, can you get corrected PPS out uh, as well as the 10 megahertz? Yes. Okay. Well, so well um, you, can, you can get the hardware PPS with a software correction measure. Um, okay. uh, so the correction message. Would, be done, would be done external to the module. Yes. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. But the one PPS for the low cost station is just kicking off the data acquisition eight kilohertz sample block for that one second. So if it's off 50 nanoseconds, I don't care. It's not going to affect me that much because I'm, you know, sampling at a much slower rate base, but I'm starting off of that. So it's my starting time, but it, you know, a 50 nanosecond error isn't going to hurt me that much. Yeah, given that that's, that's a, a cycle of 20 megs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yeah, exactly. Yeah. So okay. I, I wish we could get the pulse per second out of the cheapest module, but they just, they don't make that. You know, I mean, you could always use another external GPS for the timing as well. Yeah, I'm using one now. I think it's from uh, Adafruit. It's like a $30 GPS and yeah. I've got a board laid out and it's doing just fine as a stratum one times mm -hmm. time standard, but that's 30 bucks for that GPS. Yeah. And if I could use the $15 one to do that, I might make more sense. And then, but, yeah. Why the fifteen dollar one needs a few bucks worth of other parts around it. Yeah, well, I don't know if having two GPSs is really the right thing to do. It's, yeah, it, you're better you're better off spending the fifty five dollars than and getting both be better agree. performance plus the plus the pulse. I completely. There may be some a different manufacturer's module that would be more appropriate as well. Yeah, but yeah, fifty five dollars have to look for it is way over your budget, John. 
my budget's <laughs> been torpedoed already. So <laughs> yeah, I got I, somebody I, holding I, my backside. There, there are some I, other I manufacturers. <laughs> There are some other GPS manufacturers that are making really good stuff, but the U-Blox is widely available. They make documentation available. And uh, the others like uh, uh, Furuno uh, has uh, apparently some, some good modules. Trimble has some, but, but hobbyists have a great deal of difficulty getting at them. Uh, and U-Blox has a good reputation. And uh, I, so there could be something else that could work as well. Uh, or better, but I think with the U-Blocks, we, we're going down a path that's supportable and workable. Just so everybody knows, I put up on the HamSci website, there are 20 pictures of the teardown of Leo Bodnar GPS DO internals. Ah, la, 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 la. Yeah. Well, <laughs> actually, reverse engineering is legal. Oh, I know it is. I just, this is, this is me being... Um, <laughs> Super, what yeah, I, I, I don't it. want anybody to say that I got my idea from Leo. Yeah. And for the rest of the group, I mm. think Leo may be doing something similar to this. I don't, it's not the same design, but I think he may have the same kind of architecture in his unit. I'm basing that only on what I've seen in terms of his published documentation, but I, I really want this design to be able to say it has nothing to do with Leo's. So I'm, I'm not gonna look at your beautiful teardown. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. <laughs> not until you're done anyway. So John, how, how do they get the uh, one PPS output? Do they derive it from the 10 megahertz? So it, I know on the cheap one, they don't have that output, but on the more expensive one, what do they do to generate that? Well, the, there are the two outputs can be e either one of them can be set to whatever frequency you want so could you on the cheap one then then with one output get a one pps but no 10 megahertz if right. you were so inclined right but then you wouldn't be able to discipline right they wouldn't work with this architecture right right they, well actually <laughs> if, uh oh here we go uh, <laughs> if, <laughs> <tape> if, out. <laughs> if you if you are are perverse I am first. This is you, a first group. <laughs> you could configure the SI Labs chip to free run off the TCXO and use the the uh, pulse output for pulse per second, and then you you your frequency stability would just be the free running TCXO if that were if that were good enough for your application. So I don't think it is probably but that's something that we could do with the fpga on the data engine we could do some uh magic over there because we have some logic if if we have the ios to do it i'm not quite understanding what you're saying that we should do but if we have I'm, visibility of all those signals then yeah i i'm not saying you should I, I'm, I'm saying you just because you can do it doesn't mean you should do it oh well if i yeah, can, but I, I gotta try it i think what you're saying is you can from the 10 megahertz coming off of the silicon labs you can create a one pulse per second for that and then lock it externally through the fpga which was what well, john was trying to avoid in the first place right and the problem is you still have to have something to lock it to right and if we don't have a pulse per second coming from the gps i can give you a wonderful pulse per second but i can't synchronize it to utc right and that's that's well, the minor detail that's the problem well, so you can guarantee that the pulse per second is exactly 1.0 seconds, but you can't tell me where it is. Exactly. You know, well, John, you're when you're 10 megahertz out in node PPS, it's still putting out uh, uh, one, um, uh, it's putting out the serial data. Yeah, once a yes. second. Yeah. And you yeah. can actually synchronize it's, to that. But yeah, you can get. One of the 10 million output edges is actually the one PPS yeah. edge, so you just have to pick the right one. Well, it's the first well, one. <laughs> on, on the ASCII stream, you know, typ typically the there is an ASCII message that's that's fairly closely aligned to the top of the second. Right. So if you look, if you look f in, in the serial stream for the beginning of the message, you might be able to get within 50 or 100 milliseconds that way. It's hard to do I mean, much better than that. It'll get better because they're putting that out on the same clock that they're putting all the other stuff out. They're the same it, well, it's a clock. question of whether they bother to align it. Right. Well, some right. modules do. Yeah. And I just, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. For, 
I'm just thinking you might be able to get a, uh, you know, a, a reasonable enough one PPS and 10 megahertz by using some logic in the FPGA that we yeah. will have on the data engine that you might not have in other cases. Yeah, it's so. it's it's entirely possible. Uh, I, I could, could see that the time nuts version of this. Probably those guys are not going to buy the cheap one. I mean, they're, <laughs> why, why would you do that? I mean, you want you want accuracy. You want the the fancy one. Otherwise, why bother? <laughs> Actually, most Absolutely. of the time nuts, I suspect most of the time nuts will buy the version with no GPS at all <laughs> because, the, because they're going to use it as a synthesizer or for failover. And by the way, that's, that's the other thing. I, I went to a couple of my time nuts friends on Sunday and said, you know, I just realized something we can do with this chip. It's got four clock inputs and it will fail over from one, if, if, if input one goes away, it will switch to input two and the phase lock will smooth that out. So this is now a device that, that if you have multiple uh, frequency standards, you can pump them all in, get your output. And if any of your oscillators fails, you continue uh, with your house standard without interruption. This and is they're, you they're clock inputs on the connector. Right. Well, that's what, that's why I asked you to add those extra pins. Well, they're already there. So yeah, yeah. Now there's so, there's two different ways of doing holdover too, though, and we have to address that for different applications. One is to hold the frequency constant and let the pulse per second drift, and the other is to get bring the pulse per second into line when you get. We're not dealing with gain. pulse per second in, in this model. Remember, pulse per second is just coming raw from the GPS. If we lose GPS lock, we lose pulse per second. Thing That's, not really... That's not good. That's not good. You have to be able to keep a, a pulse per second through holdover. Well, couldn't you do this in the GPS if you're feeding the one PPS in the FPGA? I'm sorry, you could do it in the FPGA. Well, the, well, the you could do the holdover that way, and, and I mean, the FPGA can divide down to one PPS. It's just not going to be aligned to anything. Well, the, and the the, the GPS, if you lose a lock, the GPS could continue to provide pulse per second. There's no guarantee on how accurate it's going to be. Well, it'll but, be up to the, the up to the stability it, of the. Well, it has to be accurate. It has to be the pulse per second that would come out of a GPS DO. But but it'll be, it'll be accurate based upon the 10 megahertz that is not accurate anymore because there's no lock. Well, it'll be accurate could, based on the on whatever the oscillator is inside the GPS module. Right. And for the or, low cost personal space weather station, that's one of the concessions we will make because it's a low cost system and you just have to live with it. And if your antenna's up well, on the roof and you always got a good signal, chances are you'll be fine. But that kills some of the applications. Well, you just but, mark the data is invalid if you lose GPS lock. I mean, what can you do? No. We're, we're talking about a couple of units here and not just these aren't all the same radio. Yeah. Well, so I'm saying that the good, at least the good module needs to have a holdover PPS. Well, but the problem is that the same, it's the same circuit board in, in each case. It's just which GPS module we install. But the person right. station but, needs the expensive GPS because we want to do TEC. Yeah. So you're going to use the, the platinum or gold or whatever the, the high end one is. Well, but but even that one though, and D David's got got a good point that the pulse per second, even from the high end, is generated by the GPS module, and by, so so it can continue to provide PPS when lock is lost. We don't know how how much that may wobble at that time, but but we don't have a holdover flywheel on the pulse per second signal. And we also don't have control over whether it drifts back into time or if it uh, jam sinks. Right. You mean when Are lock you... comes back? Yeah, when lock comes back, when it get, regains the GPS um, signal, yeah. there are two ways of handling holdover. And one is to jam sync it. And the other is to drift it back so you don't have a discontinuity. Yeah. Now back to Scotty's point, though, you know, if assuming we've got the 10 megahertz that 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 has at least modest holdover, uh, I'm sorry, the 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 
synthesizer output will have at least modest holdover based on the TCXO. That's going into the data engine along with the pulse per second. Scotty could, in the data engine, generate pulse per second from the synthesizer output and synchronize that with pulse per second from GPS when that's valid Which you and, give and, hold and get hold over that way. Now, you said that the time nuts would like the uh, stripped down board. Are you saying that those of us who have a good GPS DO, we just use that and yeah, put it yeah. into this? The, right, be, because the, a, a good GPS DO is going to be better than this because right. it's not as, you know, as cost constrained. But what this thing does for time nuts is I've got four outputs that I can program to whatever frequency I want anywhere from, a, mm -hmm. from you know, a 10 hertz or whatever it is to a gigahertz. So VHFers will like this as well. Um, Indeed. So it's, it's the synthesizer capability. And then it's also this failover capability. So again, I, I've, got, I've got three GPS DOs. I can plug all three of them into this guy, program the, the four outputs to say f one megahertz, five, 10, 15 megahertz, that then becomes by house standard. And if I lose one of my GPS DOs, it'll seamlessly fail over to the other one. My house standard only has a, you know, a momentary phase drift while it, while it resyncs. So, John, maybe what's missing here is that the idea of having a separate time nuts carrier board for the clock module to, to provide yeah. all this integration, right. which is, I don't think we discussed that at all. So, yeah, Michael, that's a good, that's Michael a good just point. put into the chat exactly what I was going to bring up too is that if we put in our own uh, GPS, it won't have TEC available, which is something we very definitely want for a personal space weather station. And I'm right. assuming TEC is not part of the low cost system. Is that correct? Uh, well, no, but. Um, Daniel? Well, TEC I mean, is just yeah. a pass through from yeah. the GPS module. You know, T TEC was not a requirement of the low cost personal space weather station. Not for low cost, but we do want to That's have it. The... We want to encourage people to have it out there because yeah. it's extremely useful. Valuable, yeah. Um, number. So my so, takeaway from this is that John's clock module is going to provide me the 2.5, 5, 10, and 15 carrier kilohertz or megahertz carriers a kilohertz down. Yep. I can, I can give that to you. Oh, that is fantastic because that simplifies so many things for me. <laughs> John, so if, if we were to use the, the the gold version with the dual frequency GPS on it, the expensive module, we can still route the external inputs of the synthesizer to the connector. So that if you took that expensive module and put it on your time nuts carrier board, you still have the clock pulled over. Uh, right. Well, so you can still do that even if you have the gps on it the only difference is and and then how, could you also feed a, a more accurate gps into the system uh, is are there hooks on the board to be able to do that if you well, have there, a gps installed on the system already on the board already there there will be a hook on the board to plug in an external reference okay uh, so, will replace so, the... so you could use the high-end gps on the clock module to do tec and then have your Trimble super califragilistic one with sure. hot, actually that does not do TEC, but you could still feed it in as a reference. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. hmm. I've got an <clears throat> excuse me, a novice question if I could ask it here. There's something in my throat. Um, could somebody address, or if it's out of left field, let me know how we're going to get from these. GPS synchronized pulses to time stamping sample data. Where, where, how is that link made? The way I am doing it in the low cost station is setting up the Raspberry Pi to be the stratum one time reference off of the GPS model data stream and the one pulse per second. So the time stamp in the operating system is accurately synced to the one PPS. And that's how I am getting an accurate timestamp for the data. Yeah, we'll do this. That's accurate to milliseconds, not nanoseconds. Yeah. For for the for the higher performance one, it's going. Uh, the plan is to do it in the FPG, 
A itself, where the samples will be aligned on a packet boundary to the, by the PPS signal. So that'll be done in the FPGA. All right. So when you actually ask for data, we're going to wait to give you the data until we get a, a PPS boundary and then start synchronizing. And you're going to timestamp the packet? Correct. And then you'll be able to time stamp all the timestamp all the subsequent packets by just counting. But just counting. But given where, the, where does that initial time reference come from? Are you are you pulling it off the GPS? Yes. Yeah, the PPS goes into the FPGA itself. And so that, that gives you a second. That doesn't tell you what time <coughs> of day it is. The stereo data comes into the FPGA also from the from the GPS. So you're going to get the serial Correct. synthesized time from Right, but, yeah. but and we'll decode that and, and build the, the actual time off of that. Is That's there a, a synchronization issue there? Well, we'll synchronize with the one PPS, but we'll know okay. what, what second it is by reading the, the data from the GPS. Okay, that makes sense. That answer? Yeah. That's a good Do question. Do we have an explicit real-time clock separate from the GPS? Actually, there is one on the data engine. And I don't know what's on the Raspberry Pi. I think it's optional. I don't the think Pi the Raspberry Pi has, has a real-time clock on it. No. You can buy it. No, you can add it to it. You can add it, but I haven't done that. I don't but know yeah. if that's necessary can, or not to do that. Yeah, no, you can add it. It's not to add. It's still a possibility, but. Well, it the software knows what time it is, what day it is. But it's a matter of how accurate do you want it. And is it going to keep it when you power down? Well, the issue I have is if you have a power failure with the uh, Raspberry Pi, when you bring it back up with, I've got it sync synced up to an NTP server and it only sets the time exactly one minute after it boots. So for that one minute, it's off anywhere from 10 minutes to an hour and a half. So I get a time jump and I've got software right now that's fixing that. And then the file also has nulls shoved in because it got truncated and shut off without the file allocation table being updated. So we've got fixes in place for that, but I'm trying to figure out a way of not starting the collection process till I know the clock is synced. So in the data engine, we'll be depending upon the GPS to get that time. So we'll be in the same boat you're in while the GPS locks, if right. the power comes back on. However, there was also we some, we have some talk power. about loss of, of, of lock. Is there some mechanism to get the the GPS loss of signal into the FPGA? There are um, a couple of, of lock status uh, pins available. Um, uh, I'm not sure, the, the GPS might have to be actually parsing a, me a message in the serial stream. The synthesizer chip has, lo has a loss of lock indicator. So if, if the synth chip would lose its 10 megahertz in, it would, I've got it set now to turn on an LED, but obviously that could be a signal. Is, is that something the GPS or the FPGA needs to see? No? I don't know. I don't. The FPGA, I would think it would. It'll, it'll oh. relock if, it, if, if the signal comes back, it will automatically relock. But if you want to flag that something happened, that would be, you know. Yeah, a, well, the thing is, if we're taking scientific data, you want to know, is it accurate or is it not? I right. you know the Yadafruit GPS that I'm using now does have a lock indicator on it that comes right out of the GPS and I'm looking at it. So, so I you have, that. is there one on the GPS, John? John well, what's, what's interesting, there are several signals that there's nothing that, that there's no pin that says GPS lock, but I think there may be pins with other purposes that can be set to essentially do that. I need to look at, dig through the reference manuals oh. a little bit more to figure that and out. The other thing, what I, if, you, if the FPGA is receiving serial data from the, the GPS, I mean, there's probably a bit in that stream somewhere yeah. if this is locked or not. Yeah, we, we can get a status message every second that tells us whether we're, we're locked. Is, is that sufficient? I mean, once per second? I think. We have a couple extra IO pins on the connectors. All I'm saying is we might mm -hmm. connect up the, the clock chip loss of lock to one of those. Yeah. Pins. Yeah. If, if I know the NEMA stream tells me in real time the number of satellites it's locked to. And it's typically That's correct. eight, nine, ten. And it, it lists the satellite number in the in the in NEMA stream as to who's locked. And then if it comes back with three, you know you're in trouble. Actually, <laughs> you only need one for a timestamp. Oh. 
So now, it John, um, I haven't used the U blocks that much. Bit. There's only John, one for a timestamp. John, I haven't used the U box that much. Um, does it have a, a binary stream as, oh, uh, does it as have well a as a, <laughs> I mean, as opposed to the NEMA? The problem that the NEMA gives is that it tells you the time that it was, not the yeah. time that it's going to be. There, you can select um, NEMA or U-Box <laughs> binary with great granularity of what, what it outputs. And mm -hmm. on, the, on the F9 chip, you can. there are actually four interfaces. There's USB, there's uh, I2C, and there are two UARTs. And you can mm -hmm. program each of those interfaces separately with to have different message streams. Oh my uh, gosh! Sign mm -hmm. me up. <laughs> I and want we, one. And we have multiple <laughs> of those connections back to the FPGA. So, right, right, John. Uh, now I they, want they're not all connected because the the UPS or the USB is off board, right? Goes to a connector. Well, well yeah, the, yes, the the consumer you uh, right. the yeah. But but uh, but more than one of the other ports goes to the M.2 connector. Correct? Yeah, the way, the way it's configured now, two one one UART and the I2C go to the M.2 connector. The other UART goes to a header for other uses. Okay, and we still have uh, I/O pins left, com I/O pins yeah. for loss of lock or if we need something like that from the uh, synthesizer chip. Mm -hmm. Scotty, do you have the? assigned IO pins on the 40 pin header document ready yet so I can drool over it and the make sure I the 40 pin there. header or this yeah thing? um almost okay when you get a preliminary shoot yeah. one at me to make sure I haven't done anything stupid <laughs> what I did is I went through the pin out that you gave me about a month ago mm -hmm. to make sure that we have connections to all of those pins so that we can run the grape off of the DE if we want to okay that makes sense but I'll say but I, want to, I want to keep in sync with you on that because I don't want to okay. diverge because that'll cause problems down the road that I don't want to get into. Yeah. Yeah. Hey guys, I'm going to have to sign off here. Yeah, I was. Really, my my eyeballs are about to fall out. Oh my! If anybody has any last questions, I'd be happy to take them. Otherwise, we can email. Yeah, I was going to say that we're 40 minutes past our normal time, and uh, it was well worth it though. It was yeah. a good discussion. Yeah. Thank you very much, John. Thanks, John. Really John Ackerman, you did a phenomenal job. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Well, thanks. Thank, thank you. Um, if you are on the clock mailing list, I think there only are only about six people. Uh, earlier this afternoon, I sent out the slide deck and also the current version of the schematic. Uh, and that stuff's available. I just, particularly the schematic, don't hold me to anything because it's still yeah. uh, getting stared at and tweaked on. And John, if people want to join that list, they can just let me know. Yeah. I'll, yeah, let me know and I'll sign them up. Scotty, did you send me the final schematic for the magnetometer board? Uh, I don't think so. Did I, was I supposed to? Uh, yeah, because I'm going to incorporate it on my low cost version. Okay. I'm just going to have the, uh, the, the RJ45 connector coming out of that. Okay. Let, I was supposed to put it up on the server, but I think I probably spaced it out. So there I is one on the, the, the documents, can... Scotty. Is, is it the XD1? I don't know. Okay. But there I'm is a PDF off, of the schematic. We'll catch y'all later. Later, later, John. 73. Stay healthy. 73. Bye. 73, guys. John, um, did you set your, uh, in your ncp.com on your uh, Raspberry Pi, um, I use, um, I believe it's Tinker Panic Zero, so it will, um, it'll automatically uh, set the clock when it comes up. Um, do do uh, you have that in your configuration file? Right, right now what I'm doing is, I'm in the process of actually setting it up that the Raspberry Pi is a stratum one time standard. And one of the issues I'm having is it auto baud rates on the clock and you get better granularity of, of the timestamp if you run it at 115 K baud, but it defaults to 9,600 and works its way up. So it takes about three minutes before it finds it. So I'm trying to Are find you... a configuration file 
in Linux OS to tell it that the initial baud rate is 115k baud, so it comes up right away. And that should eliminate my one minute uptime before the clock gets set. That, that's what I'm fighting right now. Are you using GPS, Damon? Uh, yes, I believe so. But I noticed there's another one out that I was going to look at. Um, if you have any insight into that or references or good yes. ideas, please send them to me. I'm, I'm very much open to that because I need all the help I can get. <laughs> well, um, it, it uh, basically boils down to um, downloading the uh, latest version from, the, um, from GitHub and okay. building it. The, the newer version has runtime options for um, speed and uh, um, for, for speed and framing. Oh, and, okay. and, and so so I I use that on my um, VLF system that I have here mm -hmm. um, with my uh, Trimble. So it, it actually, as soon as it uh, comes up, it's 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 accepting binary data from the from the serial port. So um, can you send me the link to that GitHub Arc reference so I can take a look at it? It's, or put it's, in the it's, chat. Could you put it in the chat window, maybe, I, so I can look at it? Yeah. Um, it's it's the uh, GPST code. Let me find it for you. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hey, uh, John, the latest schematic XD1 is already up there. I put it up last week. So, is this on the official uh, it's, it's one that on, Nathaniel set up? No, I seem to be the only one contributing to that one. No, it's it's on the home page for Tangerine SDR. Oh, okay. Under, under working documents. Okay. And it's <laughs> Magneto Pi Hat Schematic underscore underscore XD1. I don't know why there's two underscores, but it's XD1. X XD1. Okay. One. Gonna write that down. That's the version that all everyone received. They're okay. All were sent out. Got it. Actually, I'll put that in my Amside notebook. What a what a concept. Everyone, I'm gonna say good night for the night. Yeah, you look like you're fading, Nathaniel. <laughs> yeah, I always struggle with Monday nights. <laughs> <laughs> so, Nathaniel, you're the host. So, what do you? I'll I'll just make you the host, Scotty. Okay, I'll you be can, here till. And you till can make whoever you want the host when you leave. Till death. Uh, do you want me to leave it recording or turn it off? Um, you can turn it off, I guess. All right. So I'm gonna sign off. out, also, guys. Seventy 